I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 is our text. And if you don't have a Bible with you, that's perfectly fine. Grab one of those Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1. <laughs> you might be able to find it. I don't get to tell you people to turn to page 1 very often. But uh, anyway, and as always, if, uh, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one. Just go ahead and take it. It's our gift to you because we want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible, ask for one. We will get a Bible to you because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Uh, hey, uh, just a, a quick comment. Uh, first of all, uh, yes, I'm wearing a Diamondbacks uh, jersey. I kind of thought this is the, first, you know, the latest in the season. They've been in first place in a long time. Yeah. And uh, so I, I thought I would go ahead and wear it now. Hopefully I can wear it in October and say the same thing. But, you know, it, even though it's the first month, at least there's hope, right? Uh, not much, but there's hope. Hey, uh, speaking of hope, if, especially if you are struggling with hope in any part of your life, uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're joining us online. But you'll want to come Monday night to celebrate recovery. And... Uh, you know, look, that's true every single Monday night, okay, at 6.30 in this room. But this week, you've got the, the global field director of CR. And, and you know, and I'm just going to brag on our Celebrate Recovery for uh, a moment. The reason he's coming is because God is doing amazing things in our Celebrate Recovery. And uh, it, it's, it's, you know, changing lives, and people are showing up, and it's great worship. And so if you don't, can't get enough and you want some more hope, uh, show up Monday night at 6.30. You'll, uh, God will meet you here and he'll heal you as well. Uh, so that's Monday night, 6.30 in this room. So we're continuing our Kingdom Relationship Series. We started it last week uh, and we're doing this series because every single person has relationships. Some of you are married, some of you are single. We all have families, we have friends, we have coworkers, we have people that we encounter in our day-to-day -day life like servers and providers and salespeople and we all have relationships as part of our lives. So this is a series for everyone because you're not a hermit because you're here. You're not isolated because you're joining us, whether in the room or via technology. But, but you know, so you have relationships. And if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe, like we were just singing about, that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, was raised from the dead, and you have made a personal commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Now, if you've done all that, then this applies to you, but hopefully you've also expressed that in baptism. If not, we can help you do that too. But if you're a follower of Jesus, then God has a plan for all your relationships. God has a design for all your relationships. Now, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I hope you'll listen in and, and learn about kingdom relationships and how that can be a blessing for you. And that what we hope is that you'll choose to follow Jesus and allow him to change your life because that's what he does. And today we're talking about purpose. Purpose. Why do we want to live intentionally in kingdom relationships? And maybe you haven't thought about it, uh, but uh, uh, we're, because, uh, I'm going to put this, because we all have relationships, I hope you think about all your relationships purposefully. Purposefully. I mean, I realize there are like accidental beginnings of relationships. I realize that there's some unintentional, you know, things that happen that put you in relationships. But once you're in a relationship, I, my prayer is that you treat every single relationship with purpose. And that's what God's plan is for us. So we're talking about purpose. We're going back to the beginning, Genesis creation account. Now, before we read the account, uh, before we read the passage, uh, I want to address some differing thoughts on Genesis chapter 1. Because I know that people think differently about this. And, and, uh, and you may or may not agree with me, but you know, some people hold to a strict literal uh, you know, historical creation account. Uh, it's a young earth. God took six 24-hour days to create. And if you believe that, I'm perfectly fine with that. And some people want to insist on an old earth, billions of years old of evolutionary development. And if you hold to that, I'm okay with that. And some of you are confused. Like, I don't understand. How can you do that? How can you? That's inconsistent. Well, 
not really, I'm just going to tell you what I believe Genesis 1 and 2 are all about. Actually, the, the first 11 chapters are all about. But Genesis 1 specifically, uh, and this is what I insist on, this is what my core conviction is. Uh, God created everything that is. He created it good. He created it orderly. And people are purposefully created by God. Okay? There's no accidents involved in this. Okay, there's no unintentional uh, side effects. And, and, and honestly, I'm not going to argue about anything else. You know, there's some people who want to argue about how long, you know, how old the world is. Don't care. I, I just, I really don't care because it doesn't change who I am in relationship with God one bit, whether the earth is 10 billion years old or 6,000 years old. That doesn't alter the reality that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, was raised from the dead, so that you could have a relationship with Jesus Christ, with God Almighty, for the rest of eternity. That ha doesn't impact that at all. So I don't care about arguing about that. If you believe in the Big Bang, fine. God is the Big Banger. <laughs> okay? I, that, look, that's how it works with me. So I'm not going to argue whether how it happened, because none of us were there anyway. But, uh, but I know who did it. If you believe in a young earth, fine, because God is capable of doing that. He's more than capable of doing that. He doesn't need six days. He can do it in an instant. Oh, wait, that's the big bang. Never mind. So, uh, <laughs> look, uh, but here's the thing, and I won't give any ground on this ever. People are different from the rest of creation. We are specifically created in God's image, and, and I'll never compromise that conviction. Genesis chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. This is the last day of creation, by the way. The sixth day in the account. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that lives on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Uh, first thing I want to tell you is that God created you on purpose and for a purpose. God created you on purpose and for a purpose. None of us are accidents. Okay, maybe in your parents' family planning... You're dubbed the accident, uh, but God was involved in your plan. None of, us, none of us evolved from slime or ooze or any other species. There's no missing link because God created us in his image. And that means, and I want you to hear this, because this has a relational meaning. It means that you are delightful to God. You are delightful to God. The psalmist says, I praise you, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. He praises God saying, I, look, I, I know, I understand that you, you made me fearfully and wonderfully. So in other words, you are a masterpiece designed by God, and he thinks you're wonderful. Now, you may not like some attributes that you have. You may not like your looks. You may not like your abilities or hair. But look, any defects that you have are the result of sin in this world. And, and uh, God took care of that in Jesus because you get a new body if you don't like the one you currently have. You get an upgrade if you don't like the one you currently have. And, and that's a wonderful promise. But right now, I want you to understand God looks at you and he delights in you. God Almighty delights in you. So much so that he sent Jesus to save you from your sins so that he could adopt you into his family and you could live with him forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Do you not think that God thinks you're kind of wonderful that he would do that? I mean, it not, he's not going to do that for a creation that he despises. You matter to God. See, I say that a lot of you just don't believe me. I mean, intellectually, you believe it, you agree with the words, but you don't really believe it. So look at your neighbor and tell them, you matter to God. Now, if you're the neighbor, you're supposed to tell it back to them. Some of you are like, I know. 
Now, you matter to God, and you're both supposed to say it to each other because it's true both ways. Both of you matter to God. So you are delightful to God, and you have God-given tasks to accomplish. Okay? God created you on purpose and for a purpose, and you have God-given tasks to accomplish. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 2 says, For we, people of God, are God's workmanship, his artwork. There you go. There's that wonderfully made. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, he said, look, God made you, and he made you wonderful, and he gifted you, and he has these things set apart for you to do. Let me say it again. God has things set apart for you to do. So he designed you wonderfully and purposefully. And there's an eternal to-do list with your name on it. Now, I think that's kind of cool and a little bit terrifying. And I, and I want you to think that it's cool and a little bit terrifying. Now, uh, to-do list, to me, have a, have a negative connotation. Because I grew up in a family where my parents were both workaholics. And so they always had a to-do list of chores that didn't end. Okay? And, and so I hated to-do lists because I knew, I knew not to ask. I was going to take as long as I could to accomplish every single chore. Because there was no incentive to finish. Which is why my parents called me the lazy one. And, uh, and I'm like, well, there's no incentive to finish. But see, this isn't, that's not how God's to-do list is. It's not just another chore that you got to do, got to endure, you got to make it through. The, you know, his to-do list is specifically designed for you, and that to-do list fits you. And you're going to delight in accomplishing the tasks that God has for you. Now, maybe you're like, I don't know about that, but I'm just telling you, if you're doing what God created you to do, you're going to have joy and, and energy from doing that. It's going to meet you at the sweet spot of your soul, and you're going to find delight. By the way, that's why we're always telling you, hey, God wants you to serve. We're trying to help you figure out how God wants you to serve so that you can make a difference in this world so that you can accomplish your to-do list. Because your list is not my list, and my list is not your list. In fact, your list is not even the list of the person sitting next to you. God has something specifically for you to do. So God created you for a purpose, and that means you are God's manager of your life. You're God's manager of your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Glorify God in your body. Jesus bought you with his life. We just sang about that. He's our living hope. Why? Because he died on the cross for our sins. He was raised from the dead. And when he did that, when you confess Jesus as Lord, you basically surrendered the rights to yourself to him. If you missed that, let me explain it to you. If you follow Jesus, you're saying, I give up control of my life. You are my master. You're my king. You're my God. I'm following you. That's submission. Applies to all of us. So you're saying, okay, I submit to Jesus. He's now in charge of me. I'm his servant. And Jesus says, hey, guess what? I'm going to put you in charge of you. I'm going to put you in charge of you, but you have to give account to me for how you do you. Uh, it, it's kind of a different thing. So he's appointed you to manage your life. And this is stewardship. So you don't own your own life. Billy Joel was wrong. <laughs> See, now I know who listened to the same music I did. My life, my body, my talents, my abilities, my creativity, and my relationships belong to Jesus. Because I belong to Jesus. He bought me with his blood. He bought me. And my purpose is to manage all of that for Jesus. My life, my body, my relationships, my talents, my ability, my creativity, all my time, all of that is to be managed, not for me, but for Jesus, because he bought me with a price. Because one day, I'm going to stand face to face with Jesus, and I'm going to give an account to Jesus for how I managed my life for him. 
If you're not familiar with this concept of stewardship, you need to read the Gospels because Jesus talked about it about every other parable was somebody who had to give an account to the master who took a trip and went away and did stuff. We're going to have to give an account. So um, if you're a follower of Jesus, it's not my body, my choice. It's my body, God's choice. That's how this works. That's how this relationship works. We surrender to him, his will. Why? Because he made us on purpose and for a purpose. And this concept actually goes back to creation. If you read the creation account, we, and we read parts of it, he said you're to have dominion, you're to rule and reign and take care of creation that I've given to you. You're to care for my creation. In other words, God put Adam and Eve in charge of managing creation. They screwed that up, and we're still doing it. But anyway, uh, but God's assignment for us, and, and he's put you in charge of your life for him. So you're created by God on purpose and for a purpose. Okay, does that make sense? Eight people got it. The rest of you need to watch the sermon tomorrow. So does that make sense? Okay, if it does make sense then understand wrong purpose leads to frustrating lives. Wrong purpose leads to frustrating lives. Uh, I believe the majority of our personal frustration is because we are pursuing the wrong purposes. Our lives are misaligned because we don't understand the first point that we made, and so we waste our lives in vain pursuits. We're chasing after things that we were not meant to chase after, and they are wrecking our lives and making us angry and frustrated and dissatisfied because if you chase the incorrect objective, if you aim for the wrong target, if you set the wrong goals, you're going to be frustrated because if you pursue the wrong goal, you fail even when you achieve it. If you pursue the wrong goal, you fail even if you achieve it. Isn't that what Jesus said when he mentioned what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? You missed the mark. You aim for the wrong thing. So many in our world today, oh wait, let's include us. So many in our churches today are involved in vain pursuits. We pursue happiness. I want to be happy. I just want to be happy. I got to take care of me. And, and we pursue a happiness. And we, look, and we're Americans. We pursue happiness with zest. I mean, we are into the pursuit of happiness. We're terrible at it because we're, you know, one of the leading nations of suicide, which is an indicator that you're not happy. And we take anxiety and depression meds like candy because we're not happy. But, man, it's in our Constitution. It's in our, bio, our Declaration of Independence. We can pursue happiness. And so we attain this momentary elation followed by persistent dissatisfaction. Because you weren't created to be selfish. You weren't created to be selfish. In fact, God created us to serve. Or we pursue success. I want to be successful. We want to have a successful career. We want to have a lot of money. We want to be famous. We want to achieve. That's what I want to do. I want to have success. And so we attain accolades, and we gather wealth, and we attract followers. Some people in the millions. And we get degrees and we're awarded plaques when we retire. Which all leave us empty. They don't mean a thing. Because Jesus defines success completely differently. Or we pursue power. That's right. I'm going to be in control of my life. I'm going to control myself. I'm going to control the people in my life. I'm going to control the situation in my life. Because I want to feel important. And I want to feel like I'm in control. And we get some kind of measure of false control and um, we lack love and friendship. <laughs> Henry Nouwen says it's easier to control people than it is to love people. But Jesus never tells us to control anyone except ourselves. Uh, in fact, Jesus said, if you want to be great, you have to be the servant of everyone. So, if you're pursuing anything more than Jesus, it's going to lead to frustration in your life. In fact, if you're frustrated with your life, with your relationships, with your parenting, this may be the root cause. 
because it doesn't only impact you, it impacts all your relationships. Think about it. If you're leading yourself in vain pursuits, you're also leading your marriage astray. If you're leading yourself in vain pursuits, you're encouraging your friends towards aimlessness. If you're, if you're engaged in vain pursuits, then you're teaching your children to pursue the wrong goals. In other words, you're leading them to failure. God created you on purpose and for a purpose. And our purpose is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That is not original with me. That's in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and it's quoted by just about every evangelical pastor on the face of the planet. Our purpose is to glorify God and enjoy him forever, and they stole it from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, where he says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's simple, isn't it? Whatever you do, eating, drinking, playing, working, Relating, do it to the glory of God. Your purpose is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Did you catch that? Enjoy him forever, not grudgingly comply. All right, I got to serve God. I mean, Jesus did die for me, so I guess I got to do it. Got to do what he says. You know, not, not compelled by obligation, not in like regretful servitude. All right, guys, let's go do what Jesus wants. Look, I grew up in churches where that was the prevailing attitude. You know, we need volunteers to help out with something. And you're like, all right, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> that is not fulfilling the purpose that God created you for. All right, so um, if you relish your relationship with Jesus, if you make Jesus the focus of your relational life, and, and you embrace the undeserved grace of God and adoption into his family, you start to live with the joy of forgiveness, the wonder of his love, and the encouragement of his freedom. It changes you, and it changes all the relationships that you have. Because if you get the relationship with Jesus right, it will positively and redemptively impact all of your other relationships. And you're like, okay, but how? Now, see, here's the thing. If you're enjoying your relationship with Jesus, you want to glorify God. If you know that Jesus loves you and you're loving him back, you want to please him. You want to glorify God. Everything you want to do, whether you're eating or drinking or playing or working, uh, all of it, you want to glorify God. And what is, and some of you are going like, what does it mean to glorify God? Did we just do that when we sang? Yeah, we did. But it means so much more than that. So um, since glorifying God sounds like a really religious talk, here's how I understand it. This is how I interpret that in a real practical level. So if you want something really practical, here's Chad's version of uh, that grand and glorious statement of glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's simply this, serve Jesus and bless people in his name. Okay, so serve, pe serve Jesus and bless people in Jesus' name. That's, I think that's what it means to glorify God. And if we do that, we're gonna enjoy him. So everywhere you go, everything you do, everyone you meet, serve Jesus and bless people in his name. In other words, you think about it intentionally. Okay, when I meet somebody, I gotta, I gotta serve Jesus by blessing people in his name. I gotta bless these people. How am I gonna do that? Now, here's the problem. A lot of church people are like, yeah, I gotta bless people, and they think of people they don't know. And, and that's good. You should bless the people you don't know. But it's way better if you bless the people that you're in a relationship with all the time. Because that's where you practice blessing people. Because if you're blessing strangers that you meet, and you're not blessing your family, you're messed up. Okay, that's bad Christianity. That's bad following of Jesus. So if you're married, the first person to bless is who? Your spouse. That's right. And, there's, and see, here's the problem, because a lot of us right now came into our marriage with the idea it's their job to make me happy. That's uncomfortable, isn't it? Because there's a lot of people who think it's your job to make me happy. You're failing at your job. I'm not happy and it's your fault because you did this and you did that and you burnt this and you didn't show up for that and you, and, and you didn't get this done. And we have all these lists of unhappiness because of what our spouse did. That's, that's not their, their purpose. By the way, if, if you think your spouse's purpose is to make you happy, 
then you're disobeying God and you're putting them in a place of idolatry because it's impossible. They can't make you happy. That, that's not their job. That's not their God-given responsibility. It's the wrong purpose. We can go back to that if you need to, but I think you get it. So bless your spouse. Serve your spouse. Encourage your, your partner. Help them to succeed. Bless them every single day. If you do this, I'm just, okay, some of you are like, really? Yeah, if you do this, if you actually try this, you'll be blessed. Your marriage will thrive. Your children will be blessed. And you will find happiness, success, and love, which is what people want, right? They're, they're chasing after those things, but that's the wrong pursuit. So it won't result in that. But if you pursue God and you serve Jesus and bless people in his name, you'll actually end up hap with happiness, success, and love. Now, if you're single, your whole life can be a conduit of blessing, beginning at your family, because you still have family. Maybe you move far away from them for a good reason, but you still have family. <laughs> and so whoever you surround yourself with in terms of relationship is your family, and you need to bless them every single day. But you can be a conduit of blessing to everyone you meet, family, friends, coworkers. And if you do this, you're going to be blessed, and you're going to thrive. And guess what? You'll find happiness and success and love. That's how this works. And this is the crazy truth. If you pursue happiness, success, love, or power, you'll end up frustrated and empty. But if you pursue Jesus, and if you serve Jesus and bless people in his name, you'll end up getting all the things you wanted and more. But you gotta believe Jesus. You have to believe God and submit to his plan. Remember, you were created on purpose and for a purpose. Um, and if you live your life on purpose in Jesus, you'll be amazed at what God does in your life and in your relationships. Will you pray with me? Father, it is still incredible that you love us, that you love me. That even though you know our sin, our rebellion, our defiance, and, and all of the vain pursuits that we have set up as idols in our lives, you still pursue a relationship with us. You still forgive us of our sins. You still adopt us into your family and you still promise us heaven. We don't deserve any of it, but you love us like crazy. And you grieve when our relationships struggle. You grieve when we're lonely because we don't have friends. You grieve when our marriages crumble. You grieve when our children uh, and, and parents don't get along and and so, God, we come to you for help. Teach us how to pursue you. Teach us how to serve you and bless people in your name and change our lives. And God, give every person that's listening, every person that's part of this, just the courage to believe you and make a change in their life. This is my prayer. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.